First Peter chapter 1. We'll be reading verses 1 through 9 this afternoon. And the title of the message is God's Remedy to Live for the Lord and Resist Persecution. That is, resist persecution when we're living for Christ. If we're not living for Christ and uh, experience uh, 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 problems, it's uh, probably because of bad, bad decisions. But here in this passage that we'll be studying this afternoon, we'll be looking at God's recipe to live victoriously <coughs> in, the, in the very um, corrupt world. So let's read, first of all, 1 Peter chapter 1. We've already covered verse 1 and 2. We'll be concentrating on verse 3 and on. And uh, I have six points that I'd like to share with you from this section of Scripture. It starts out by Peter putting his brand there. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And then gives us uh, where this letter is supposed to be going to. And we will see immediately that the, the letter goes to Christians who were scattered and were going through a very, very difficult times because of their witness for Christ. To the strangers scattered through Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And now he goes into the subject telling them, uh, you're not in this condition by chance. <coughs> God has a plan. In verse 2 we read, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience, and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the Father and God, and blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance. Notice now the conditions or the quality of this inheritance. Incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith, Unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last day, uh, the last time, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. That the trial of our faith, being much more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory. At the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, ye believe, yet believe, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father Pam Peter is going to be going through much more. You revealed this letter to him through the Holy Spirit 2,000 years ago. And it, it had reached, reached us in the later days. And uh, although this letter was sent to persecuted Christians, uh, during that time, Lord, we can find a great application for our lives today. Father, many Christians somehow are kind of becoming more and more backslidden more neglectful. They tend to make uh, Christianity just a thing that maybe they do half an hour in the day or an hour or two on Sunday. But Lord, we need to understand what you have given us in order for us to be able to live successfully, victoriously in this world in which that surrounds us. Mm -hmm. I pray, Lord, that you will give me the filling of your spirit the enablement to be able to bring a clear message, one that will excite us, one that will encourage us, and that uh, to not just uh, give a few hours in the week, uh, Lord, in service to you, but to give you the whole week, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Father, I pray that you will open our eyes, <coughs> and Lord, give us revival. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, I want to speak today about how to personally, how to personally, to live so that this wild, vile world 
would not be able to do to you and to me what it did to a man named Lot. Uh, I mean, you can remember what happened to Lot. If you, if you read the scriptures, you will find that Lot um, uh, just got tangled up in the things of this world. It got closer and closer into Sodom and Gomorrah and their ways and just wasted his life, his family, his marriage, everything just went overboard. Now, if you remember Lot, you will know that Lot's story is a tragic story of a man who, again, destroyed a life, a life that could have been full, like his uncle's. And we see the process of that. Lot went through a process. First, the world courted Lot, and then the world conformed him to their ways, and then the world corrupted him, and finally, he paid the cost. And, it, uh, and it's a good illustration of how the tra his tragedy could be also our tragedy. We see today many Christians who are not living for the Lord. Or they have made the Christianity just maybe an hour or two thing during the week. But today we'll be studying a passage here in 1 Peter which we will see God's recipe. Now it's a recipe to overcome worldliness. Well, Peter speaks about many things here. First of all, first of all he is directing this letter to those who have, been got, have, who have been begotten again, that is, being born again. And because they have been born again, they have a living hope. And because they have a living hope, there is many things, even in the middle of difficulty, many reasons that they, they, they would have to continue living for the Lord and praise the Lord and glorify the Lord and honor the Lord with everything they do. The Lord wants to find each one of us in a way that where we, our lives will serve to praise Him, to honor Him, to glorify Him. So, in these verses that we just read, we see God's recipe for overcoming the world. Now, I'm sure that if you're here this afternoon, you'll say, Pastor, that's exactly what I want to do with my life. I don't want to be part of that world. That is the worldly system that the devil has put in motion. I don't want to be part of that. I don't want the same thing to happen to me that happened to Lord to Lot. I don't want to court uh, the, the world. I don't want to be conformed to the world. I, want, I don't want to be corrupted by the world. Because I know that if I do that, then it will cost me. I'll have to pray. I'll have to pay the price. Now, the Lord never told us to, uh, to fight worldliness. Now you might be surprised about that. You say, Pastor, hold on. I thought we were supposed to stay away from the things of the world, but uh, no, we are, we are to overcome the world, but never to fight worldliness. Now, if you fight worldliness, you are bound to fail. The Bible never tells us to fight worldliness. Notice what the Bible does tell us. So the Bible says, this is the victory, even our faith. Not our fight, but our faith. So the idea of, over, uh, the, in order to be able to overcome the world, we need to increase our faith. We need to understand what we have in Christ. Now to give you an understanding of this, uh, imagine um, uh, your wife or maybe your hus husband said, says tonight, hey, I'm going to give make the, that wonderful meal that you like so much, that wonderful dish. And they spend uh, all afternoon cooking and preparing a wonderful, delicious uh, meal. And uh, at the end of the day, you, you enjoy that meal and you feel full, you're satisfied. And then you decide to go out, take a walk, and somebody comes with the scraps from a, from a, from a, uh, uh, from a garbage bin and says, Can I offer you some of this? And well, you would say, uh, No, thank you. I am fully satisfied. I have what I need. You would not be tempted by the scraps that the world can give you. And this is the idea here, is that if you know how to be satisfied with the things that God has already provided you, and has waiting and you, and that has, He has waiting for you in the future, you won't want the things of the world. Our faith needs to be increased. I imagine another illustration. I, I can, I can, I'm a, I'm a very good witness of this. I used to have a, um, a Conquer Spaniel, and if you know anything about Conquer Spaniels, they're, they're very territorial. They go into a room, they think they own it. 
The first night, the first day we brought him home, brought her home, uh, she wouldn't let him into the living room. And she took possession also of the kitchen. She wouldn't let us use, I mean, she would be growling. And she had, although she was a small dog, she had a, the growl of a lion. And does not even mention having a bone on her mouth. If, you had, she, if you, she had a bone uh, and you try to take it away from her, I would not recommend it. Um, <clears throat> so many times you would see that she would, be, you know, uh, rolling that bone all over the, the floor and it'd be, you know, it was, it was all kinds of things were sticking on the bone. It's a, you know, it's just disgusting, but she, it was her treasure. And of course I wanted to remove it and every time I got close to the bone, the, the dog would just growl. It was just like, whoa, you know, don't, how do you take that bone away from that dog? I don't recommend you try to snatch it from her, from her mouth. I learned that if you bring, bring a nice piece of the meat, um, some beef, and you put it close by, she would start doing this thing where I, you know, start looking at the bone, look at the meat, look at the bone, look at the meat, and then she would drop the bone and go direct for the meat, and then you can just take the bone. Well, friends, that's exactly what the Lord has given us in order to not be attracted by the things of the world. We need to understand the things that God has provided us, and this epistle of Peter will tell us how to be godly in a very ungodly world. How to stay uh, spiritually clean in a world that is wicked. And if you, uh, this is, I think this will be a lesson also if you had you know, kids or grandchildren. You might want to teach your children how to behave, how to be um, better people. And I know that some parents sometimes uh, do it by telling them what not to do and what to do and they just bring a long list of things. Don't do this and do this and don't do this and do that uh, in order for them to be um, uh, to behave and you know you can do that and I think we need to put, uh, put limits to our children uh, but that's not going to be very uh, effective. I think the best one thing we can do is tell them uh, the riches that we have in Christ so that they won't be attracted to the things of the world. So the idea with this epistle is, hey, I know you're going through a hard time, Peter, telling us that you've lost your homes, now you're scattered as strangers, you, are, you don't even have a citizenship in those places where you live, you're being persecuted, and in the middle of all this loss, he says, now you can greatly rejoice. You, don't, you have all the reasons to not mingle with this world that is persecuting you. And uh, so we have, uh, Peter's going to give us six wonderful things that we need to know. The recipe, the divine recipe to overcome wealthiness. And just so that you know where we're going, uh, one of the things that he's being, will be speaking about is Something that we hear about all the time, but that very few Christians truly, truly understand. And that is, know, I mean, really know, reckon, have a deep-seated deep understanding that you are specially loved by God. You might say, well, that, that's nothing new. You know, but you know, when you start understanding that, I mean, we all know that God loves the world. For God so loved the world that He gave. But understanding that He has a special love for you, Brother Yuichi, the Lord has a special love <coughs> for you. You believe that. Now, when, when you start believing this, when you really believe this, then your behavior changes. I had a missionary in Ireland one time. He, uh, he was a missionary for many, many years, and he uh, wrote me a note one time. He said he was very excited. I mean, a missionary that's been preaching the gospel for more than 40 years. And one day he was very excited. He said, Sammy, I finally understood that God loves me. I said, well, good. It only took you 40 years to understand that. But no, he was saying, no, no, no. Hold on. I, said, I mean, he really, he really loves me. His name was Bob Semeski. Bob Semeski's character was an easy one. But... Once he understood that God loved him, his attitude towards other people changed. So this afternoon I'm here to tell you, Peter is going to be telling us, that we are specially loved. Can you all say that aloud? God loves 
me. Put your name there, if you will. He loves you, Samuel Perez. You say, who's that? It's me. Everybody knows me about Sam. But he loves me. You know what that's going to do to you? It's going to make you not want to have anything, any love towards the things of the world. And this is what Peter's going to be pounding through all the, every chapter in the book of in, in First Peter. You are specially loved, John. He said, but there's very few people that love me. Well, you know, if you have God's love, that's really all you need, right? Amen? Mm -hmm. Now, I, 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 for many years, I've had a problem with that. It's not a problem that, you know, I don't believe it. It's just that I couldn't assimilate it, it you know, soak it in. But, you know, when you understand that that infinite, supreme, all-powerful, all, -powerful, all um, uh, not, uh, uh, omniscient, and all-present God, the, 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 the ruler of the universe, that, that immense God loves me. When you, when you start soaking in that, something happens. The love of this world disappears. Then also, in this divine recipe to overcome the world, Peter wants us to understand that, he wants us to know that you are strategic, strategic, strategically placed. Let me tell you one thing, none of us in this room belong to Ben Madana. I mean, none of us were born here. This morning we had, I think for a long time, three young Malagueños in our service. And uh, it kind of felt strange because for them, I think, because they, you know, everybody else was from a different part of the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, one of the, uh, the brothers that just recently got saved, he brought a friend uh, called uh, Jacobo. And I said, Jacobo, you're not here by accident. God has a plan for you. And God gave that plan and used uh, Eduardo and many other people to bring him here. And I want to tell you this afternoon, and this is what Peter, this is why Peter starts with verse 1. You are strangers scattered throughout Pontius, um, Galatia, and all these different places, and God knows about it, and God has a plan for you. He has elected you to do something. So in this point, we'll get, I'm going to be stressing the idea that God wants you to know that you're, you have, God has a plan for you. You're, you're, if you're here, God has strategically placed you here to do something. That means that when you get up in the morning, you have a purpose. That's important. And the third thing that Peter is going to be telling us is that, or trying to secure in our hearts, that we are eternally secure. That no matter what you do, your salvation doesn't depend on your behavior. It depends on the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the, on the cross. So that now you can be and to understand that nothing that you do will ever affect your eternal security. Now, you might, some of you might say, well, that, that means I can do whatever I want. Yeah, you can do whatever you want, but if you have the Spirit of God, you're not going to go and do whatever you want. You're going to do what He wants. That's the difference. But this is important because, John, you've been here for many, many years, and we've had visitors come and say, one that came with a very excited to the church, then I engaged in conversation, and in the conversation, he told me that uh, he didn't believe in eternal security. He, he believed that God saves by grace, but that now it depends on your behavior to keep that salvation. I said, how can you get up in the morning and know that you know, you're going to be saved at the end of the day? Mm -hmm. it, would, it would break, it would just drive me crazy. Have I lost my salvation? What do I need to do to... Make sure that I keep my salvation. Do I need to get saved again if I lose myself? You know, so here in this letter, Paul is going to tell him, no matter what circumstances you go through, no matter what situation, if you're born again, if you're reborn, as he puts it here, you're eternally secure. You have a position in Christ that nobody can break. And then the fourth thing, I think it's very important that we understand, if we understand this, we won't be pursuing the riches of this world, the things that this world has to offer. The Lord wants us to know in this recipe that you are incredibly rich. Now, you might have great possessions, but that doesn't make you truly rich. I have a friend, a Norwegian friend, who is truly rich. I don't know if you have any really wealthy friends, but, you know, when you go out for dinner, you, you're... With somebody like that, you're glad that you're not paying. 
<clears throat> because the bill can go up to 100, 200 years. Uh, 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 but somehow they feel that because they have all these things, they are up top. But let me tell you, and the Bible that secures this, is that you are incredibly rich because we will inherit something that Christ secured. And then the fourth thing that, I think the fifth thing that we need, sorry, the fourth thing that we need to understand, the fifth, know that you'll be purposely tested. Every one of us here, if we're born again, we're going to be purposely tested. God has a plan for you, and the plan, and the plan is to conform you to the image of Christ. And in order to do that, He has to test you, He has to pass you through exams. We have several young people in our, in our church now, some are going through university, and I said, how many of you like exams? Nobody raised their hand. Mm -hmm. Nobody likes to be tested. I said, but how many of you appreciate mm -hmm. going through exams, especially when you pass them? Especially when you get a job and now you, you're going to have to use that, uh, you know, your, your knowledge to be able to perform that job. God is going to purposely test you. He has designed tests just for you. If you want to know more about that, you need to go to James chapter 1 and 2. He, you know, this for me was also a big one. Because I thought, Lord, you know me. You know, it was Sammy Perez. You know, Sam Perez. And boy, you know, there's so many things in my life that still need to be corrected. Are you sure you know what you're doing? <laughs> so I, I, I pray that way to the Lord sometimes. This is a sure do, and I know just exactly what to bring into your life in order to change you, to transform you to the image of Christ. And when I think about that, I get nervous because there's a lot of things to change. But He has a purpose in saving you. Which means that no matter what situation we go through, God has it under control. And then in the middle of all this, the sixth thing that God wants to know in His divine recipe for us to overcome the world is that you need to know that you should be joyfully expectant. In other words, no matter how hard things get, if you are in Christ, if you're living for Christ, even if you're not um, living, um, you know, the, all the blessings that you expected to get, you can joyfully wait. You can have a unexpected, a, 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 a happy expectation to what's coming. You know, sometimes we, I see Christians when they come into the church like they uh -huh, like, you know, the canary died. <laughs> now, what's wrong? Well, they, they have this kind of cloud over their head and I think they need this message. They surely need to understand this because once we understand this, we will understand that God has not given up on you. God loves you. God has placed you in a situation strategically. Uh, no matter what happens, you're not going to lose that salvation. That, you know, God has wonderful things that He wants you to discover, riches that are unmeasurable, and that whatever situation you're going through, God is testing you, is bringing a test just for you. Now, if I was God, and I need to, John, you need to change seats because otherwise you're not going to be picking on you all the time. <laughs> I hope you don't mind. Because you know, if I was God and I had to choose uh, uh, to, to test John, I would say, I'm going to keep an eye on you and see what, what areas. Uh, if I uh, maybe I'd ask uh, Diana, Diana, tell me uh, John's weaknesses. Oh, do you have time? <laughs> and then he would say, Well, maybe even about it. Maybe even he would get it. So, wow, you know, I've got a lot of things I need to be bringing on top of John. And if, if, considering that I'm John, I'm God, and I know what I'm doing, I'm say, John, for the next 20 years, guess what, buddy? <laughs> I'm going to be busy on you. Goody, bring it on. You know, you can have a joyful expectation. Mm -hmm. You can look at life and say, no matter what happens, Peter is bringing, bringing the whole thing here. It says, you can greatly rejoice. You know, I tell the congregation often that the one that is less known by going through these books is the preacher because I have to understand these things. And then I have to internalize these things. And then understand that this is not just for me to preach to you, it's something that I need, the Lord is trying to have me understand 
so that I can gain all these benefits. And when that starts sinking in, tell me, when, you know, I don't, it, it, I, I get this, this tremendous flow of joy in my heart, thinking, Lord, I hope that the congregation gets at least half of what you have given me by understanding this. So we get to the first point, and that is, know that you are specially loved. Look with me again in verse 1 and 2. Notice the condition uh, that Peter's writing this message in, um, uh, in. He says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and he continue studying the rest of the book, you will see that this, uh, th these scattered strangers were going through a very difficult time. They had lost their homes. They had lost their jobs. They, uh, they, they lost their friends. And now they're all over the place. They're strangers. Wherever they, they now live, they are looked as, as uh, aliens. They're all over the place. They're scattered like seed throughout these places that he mentions here. But then immediately when you move into verse 2, you understand that God knows about this. He not only knows, he foreknows. He's, he's known all along. And he selected, he said, elected according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father. And then he, he moves in to tell us that the Holy Spirit is also involved in this great work. And then later on, he talks about the blood of Jesus Christ that sprinkled. So you have the, the, the whole trinity of God in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit saying, we are involved in this. So it's not just the Father saying, John, are you ready? No, the, the Jesus Christ says, uh, I'm involved here too. And the Holy Spirit says, Hey, hey, uh, you know, you can't do this without me. The, all of us are involved in this great work. So mm. the Trinity is involved in my life. And I would say the same thing to you. Understand, first of all, that He loves you to, uh, to the point that He has become very uh, involved in your life. These two verses tell us great things about the triune God. First of all, we understand that God the Father planned it. He's planned it. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Now, when did this take place? Well, um, when did God set His love upon you? I would answer that this way. In the council halls of eternity. Before you knew anything about it. Before He had swung this world into space. Before, dear friends, anything was he already had it under control. Before the foundation of the world, He loves you. And if you connect this with other verses in Scripture, for example, all, all of us should know by memory John 3.16. But notice that He's talking about a love that He has for the lost world. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believed in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. But now that we are in Christ, what greater love? What he have for his children. Folks, I'm here to tell you this afternoon that you are a wanted child. My two boys kind of came a surprise. But I, I, I really um, get excited for those couples who, you know, they, they plan their children. Uh, they get married. I was talking to uh, Eduardo the other day and Pamela. They're not married again. They, they planned it. They're planning to get married, and I said, I'm sure one day you'd like to have children. And Pamela grabbed um, Edward, uh, Eduardo's uh, arm and says, yeah, and many of them. I wonder if they're planning their children. But I want to tell you that you are a planned child. You're a wanted, a wanted child. God didn't just say, oh, now we have John in the family. Oh, what am I going to do with him? No, no, he says, no, no, this is, I, I know about this. And, and by the way, before John comes, I have a plan for him. Oh, and by the way, John, no matter what happens to you, you can be excited about this because it's all under control. Before he even knew this, God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit, they're all into this. And if we understand, we think, really? That, is he that personal? Does he really want to become that personal with me? Does he really want to have that personal relationship with me? Does he want to get involved in changing me in such a spectacular way to conform me to his son? 
Really? Is, is that the kind of God that wants to... Is, is, is that what he wants to do with me? What should this start soaking in, folks? You can't help get excited. It's a wonderful thing. And the wonderful thing about this in Revelation 22, 17, it says that it can be whosoever. Whosoever may, may come, can come. He, if you want, come, it says. Whosoever will, may come. So we have the God the Father, who is the one who planned it, but noted now, notice now, who is the one that performs it. In verse 2, we see that the Holy Spirit is involved in this. Look again at verse 2 right now. According to the foreknowledge of God, uh, through, what do you find next there? The sanctification of the Spirit. Now, the word sanctification is a big word. How many of you know what that means? It's not just to cleanse you. The word sanctification is, uh, that is not an ordinary word in our conversation. It's not a street uh, conversation, not a business place conversation. It literally means to set aside for a special purpose. So let's go back to John again. And by the way, if you're here, this is put your name on it because it goes for you too. John, I have a plan for you. I've set you, now are you saved? Mm -hmm. I've set you, I want you now, this is what my plan for you is not just to do whatever you want, but I have something better for you than your own will. I have put you aside for what? For a special, get that word please, a special service, a special purpose. And the Holy Spirit has got involved in this. God the Father planned it, but notice now the Holy Spirit performed it. God the Spirit convicted us of our sin. God the Spirit revealed the Lord Jesus Christ to us. God the Spirit put faith in our heart by the hearing of the word. And God the Spirit put the, the desire for salvation in our heart. You thought it was all about you, didn't you? Oh, how many times I rejected Christ before I was saved. I even mocked Christians. I even got, used God's name in vain. I'm, I'm surprised that God didn't just strike me with lightning and do away with me. Make me evaporate. In the middle of all that rejection, God was working in miraculous ways that I didn't understand then. Later on, when I went to Bible uh, seminary, that's when I started understanding what salvation involves. And I thought, whoa, did I ever tell you about that? When I was in, I think it was the second year in the seminary, they, we were doing, we were doing um, uh, Bible doctrines. We went through the doctrine of salvation very um, carefully, very closely. And, and after a few months of studying this doctrine, uh, the teacher asked us, well, you know, of all the doctrines that we have studied, uh, if we could write a, a kind of a, um, a, a paper on, or how do you, how do you say it in English? Um, essay. Essay. An essay, yeah. Uh, just just you know, write everything you know about salvation, mm -hmm. of everything that we studied. And, and I said, well, you know, I'm oh, sorry about the doctrine. And I chose salvation thinking it was going to be one of the easiest ones. I thought in two pages I would write everything about salvation. You know what? I I I, I went into thirty uh, pages, eight, 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 four pages, all written by, you know. And it was like I need another hundred pages. When I started discovering everything that's entangled in salvation, I thought, Wow, the Lord was doing this all the time without me knowing. And here we see that. God the Father planned it, but now the, God the Holy Spirit is, has opened my eyes and poured His love, the love of Christ, in my heart. I didn't have that before. I, re I became an atheist. And for some years, I was a militant atheist. I was looking for people to convince of how ridiculous it was to believe in God. It was almost like of course, uh, Paul wasn't an atheist, but remember how he persecuted the Christians until he found, met person to person with the Lord Jesus Christ and everything changed. For me, 
It was like rejecting Christ in every possible way, making people realize that they were fools for believing in God until the Lord did all this and put me under conviction and brought somebody again and again and again and again and brought them again to share this out, the message of salvation. Steve Pico, and then somebody else just to back him up. Johnny Carrillo, and then somebody else, uh, Joe, Joe Thames. Each one from different um, uh, cultural backgrounds. Everyone with the same message, with a smile in their heart, with joy in their hearts, sharing this wonderful message. And they, they played dirty, I say this all the time. They went to the church and they said, hey folks, I have a friend over there at the base. His name is Sam Perez. We need to pray for him that the Lord will convict him. Folks, we are utterly, totally, completely dependent upon the Spirit for salvation. And notice now, not just that we are set aside for a special purpose, that's a sanctification, but notice that now the next line, he did it unto obedience. Unto obedience. Now, we're not saved by works, are we? In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, it says it's not by works, so that nobody can boast. It's a, it's a gift of God. Now, we're not saved by works. We're saved by grace through faith. But we are saved unto obedience. You're not saved by obedience. I cannot work my soul to be saved, but I can be saved by the work of the Lord by the work that the Lord has done. And uh, may, I say, may I say something else, and this can be extreme. It's something that the Apostle Paul would say, we should work like a slave for the love we have of God's dear Son. When he says that he's an ambassador for Christ, he says, oh, ambassador? No, no, hold on a second. The idea in the Greek is that a third quality, a third great slave. And he says, I'm doing this as one of the greatest privileges that I have ever received. We should work like a slave for the love we have of God's dear Son. And someone put it this way, you're not saved by faith and works, but you are saved by a faith that works. And you don't have to guess what the work is, because in verse 10, chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, not saved by works, but then in verse 10, saved unto good works, which God has already prepared for you. So our mission, listen, now listen, this is where it becomes practical. Your mission, my mission, raise your hand if you're still here. Are you still with me? It's already 20 after. You go into this book and try to discover what God wants you to do. Amen? You don't try to rediscover Christianity. You just go into the Bible, and we're finding this right now in 1 Peter, and say, okay, Lord, you have saved me unto, not by works, but unto good works, the one that's works that you have already planned, that you already have set uh, for me. And so what are we to do? Uh, discover that what God wants us to do and do it. But notice now, and the last thing I'll, I'll close, Notice it is planned by the Father, it is performed by the Holy Spirit, but there's more. And, and it is purchased by who? You have the Trinity. So who could it be? The Son. Notice the next line in verse 2. And sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now there are three times in Scripture, in the Old Testament, that we have this, what we might call the ceremonial sprinkling of blood. And if you study that carefully, you will see that how that gives us a picture of what the Lord has done with us as Christians. For example, one time there was a sprinkling of blood when a leper was cleansed. It was a miracle. No doctors or medicine could cleanse a man with leprosy. Only God could do that. And from time to time, God would miraculously cleanse the leper. And when the leper was healed, he had to be ceremonially cleansed. And so, what they would do is they would take two doves, two precious innocent birds, doves, and they would take a basin with running water in it, and the priest would take a dove and he would kind of wring his neck and kill it, 
and that in that basin of running water, and the blood would be shed there in the basin. And then the priest would take the other dove and place that other dove down into the bloody water, and then once soaked in that bloody water, they would release the dove, giving a picture of, of, uh, of freedom. Now he's free. Now he is um, cleansed. Now he is he can fly away and it gives us a great picture of being set free. But it didn't end there. After the high priest had done that, then he would take the rest of the bloody water and sprinkle it on the leper that had been cleansed. You know what that pictures? The sprinkling of blood was for a cleansing. Then also the sprinkling of blood was now, let's listen, cleansing and consecration. <laughs> now, the priest was involved. And when the priest was ordained in Leviticus 22 as part of the ordination, they would take it as a sacrifice, as a sacrifice was made. And half of the blood would be sprinkled on the altar, and then the rest of the blood would be sprinkled on the priest to ordain him and set him aside for the priesthood. You say, what does that mean, Pastor? What does that have to do with me? Listen. My dear friend, not only have you been cleansed by the blood of Jesus, but you have been, listen carefully now, and, and soak this in, you have been consecrated by the blood of Jesus. You say, but Pastor, I'm not a priest. Well, in the sense of the Old Testament, no. In the sense of the Catholic Church, no. But we are priests. Did you know there, there are what we what I call Baptist pri uh, priests. I've never seen a bad Baptist priest. Well, you have one right now. Well, can you prove that with Scripture? Well, sure I can. You've got to come with me to chapter 2, verse 5. There, there, when, when you're talking about priesthood, you're talking about a mediation. God is here, here in the world, and we're in the middle mediating for Him. Look what uh, Peter says in chapter 2, verse 5. Um, Ye also, as lively stones, are built up as a spiritual house. What's the next line? A holy priesthood. John, did you know that you were a priest? <laughs> and what is your mission as a priest, John? To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So here you have this. Every one of us, we understand the application, the principle behind that. God has cleansed us with His blood, and He has consecrated us to do something for Him, to mediate for Him. And then look at chapter 2, verse 9. Another thing that He has chosen us to do is a, as a, a priesthood. He says that you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. You know what you have here this afternoon? A royal blue blood. No one amen there? If from now on you can call me Prince Sam. I'm only kidding. But I want you to understand that this is not exaggeration. Peter is putting it here just like he had received it from the Holy Spirit. A chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation a peculiar people that you should show for the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God, now you are a mediator, you're a priest in the sense that God has given you a message and he says, go and share it with the world. Every time you mediate that way, you are a priest, a, a mediator, one who God has not only cleansed, but one, one who has been consecrated and all this is sealed by a covenant of blood. Not the blood of a dove or an ox, but the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'll tell you what it means. It means that there has been a cleansing. If you're here this afternoon, you say, I am reborn, I am saved. I know the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I know right now for sure, 100%. If I die right now, I will go straight to heaven. Not on my, on my merits, but on His merit. Because I trusted 
in the saving work that he did on the cross. I know that that is my situation. That's been a cleansing. But you need to also know that you have been cleansed and also consecrated. Now this is something that not many Christians get to understand. If you understand the second part, you won't be just coming to church. Please listen, I know it's already uh, uh, 6.30. This is important for us to understand. Like I said before, if you understand these things, you won't have any appetite for the things of the world. You, we need to be consecrated. Consecrated. Not just be committed. You know the difference between committed and consecrated? Right now you have committed an hour and a half to come to church. And some of you might be satisfied with that. Say, well, now I can go home. I put in my two my two uh, pence, and now I can be home. Go home. I've done my job. I've done my. Uh, I did what I'm supposed to do. No, folks, that's how you be the beginning. When we leave this place, we are still consecrated to do something for the Lord, and it's not just something uh, 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 um, um, that you have to do, have to guess. It's. It's not something abstract, it's something very, very specific. Cleansing, consecration, and then there's a sealing, there's the covenant in the sprinkling of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Trinity, this is what I want to close with tonight, the Trinity is involved. God the Father planned it, God the Holy Spirit performed it, and God the Son purchased it. Now a person who sees this, a person who understands this, then this world, this strangle hold that the world has on them will be broken because it says, what a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful salvation I have. Especially loved, and Lord willing, next week we'll see the next wonderful truth, the, the second ingredient in this recipe we are strategically placed. Very soon, Lord willing, the Lord will be taking uh, Yuichi and Midori to England. I know they had planned this beforehand. Can I use that illustration, Brother Yuichi? What for? Well, I want to see family, I want to see friends. I, I, I have plans. Uh, but there's something more there. Uh, hopefully, I'll go there to the Lord saying, Lord, whatever you take me. Maybe at the airport. Maybe there in the shopping mall, somewhere we go, some, maybe with our friends. I have been strategically placed to serve the Lord. Now there are many Christians today, not many, but some Christians today who kind of go like they're, they, are, um, they are in secret service. <laughs> Pastor, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Christian. Oh, I didn't know. Oh, that's because I'm in secret service. I'm kind of, uh, nobody knows, I, uh, I, I'm just uh, like a spy, you know, or I kind of work in both sides of the, of the game, you know, I work, I, I have a participation in that world out there, and I also have a participation, I'm a double spy. Look, folks, if that's your case, you are in the wrong place. We are here to be a light to the world. We are here to tell others of the wonderful riches that we have in Christ, and if we don't do it, then we're probably Christians under disguise. And let me tell you, if that's your case, you're not in the right place. Planned by the Father, performed by the Holy Spirit, purchased by the Son. What a wonderful truth. Going back to my dog, if you wanted to take that rotten bone from his mouth, but you need to do it. You need to put something that's better. And when the Lord tells us, you know, puts this kind of stake in front of us, what are you going to do with this world? You're going to let it go and say, you know, I don't have time for that world. Why? Because God especially, especially loves me. And he has a purpose for me. Let's all stand and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. I just basically gave an introduction, Lord, of what's coming. But as we go through these wonderful truths, Lord, may we soak in them so that we make them personal. This is not just hopeful thinking. 
This is a reality if we are in Christ. And once we reckon this to be true for us, once we realize the tremendous privilege that we have now as reborn sons, saved by the blood of Christ, once we understand that, we will understand that not just the Father is involved, but the Holy Spirit is involved, and Jesus Christ comes and seals it up. As we discover the other points that Peter is going to be bringing us, Lord, may we uh, feast in this great, um, these great truths. And as we leave this afternoon, Lord, may we continue, continue chewing on this truth, savoring this, digesting this, make it true in our life, make it, understand that this is true in our life. We will have the devil trying to convince us that this is all just superficial preaching, that this is just uh, something that we go to do for an hour and a half to listen so that, okay, now I've done my share. But Lord, this is not just for that. This is something that you planned and that you want to continue performing in us. Awaken us to these truths so that we can live them out. And when the world around us can see these wonderful things in us, I think they will be attracted to Christ also. And this is where our mediation, our priesthood comes in. Are we to be Christians in disguise, secret Christians? in a secret service or are we going to be open about our faith? Is it going to show in the way we live? I pray Lord that these things will uh, be, be, we'll be able to show these things in our life. Convict us Father, continue giving us understanding. And Lord, if there's anything this afternoon that we need to release, some old mundane bone, something that we have picked up from this world, we think is so precious. As we look at these wonderful things here, this recipe, may we be attracted to that so that we can leave that old bone away. <clears throat> feast on that wonderful truth that you have given us here. Help us, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brother John.